B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, news and comment. Feeling lucky? It's Friday, January 13th, 2017. Well, I have found a new low in corporate propaganda, as presented by MSDNC. That's what I call MSNBC, because they so faithfully carry the water of the Democrats. And last night, as I said, was a new low. The previous low for Rachel Maddow, a woman who I met many years ago when she was working at Air America. I have great respect for her. But in January of this year, she had a broadcast from Las Vegas where she claimed that Bernie Sanders supporters had thrown chairs in anger at the managers of the Democratic primary caucus in the state of Nevada, which was ultimately claimed by Hillary Clinton. And to depict the scene that did not occur, Rachel Maddow reached into the library, the archives at NBC, and pulled up footage of a World Wrestling Federation staged event where they intentionally threw chairs at each other, folding chairs. And the new low that we reached last night was when Rachel Maddow used her opening segment to spin up fear that unrelated technical glitches represented the possibility of expanded Russian hacking. Now, a lot of this was done with innuendo, what I would call insinuendo, the tactics that we have exposed when propagandists, uh, whether it's George W. Bush or Barack Obama, have used them. So let's talk first of, uh, of all about what happened. One of the events is that during the Capitol Hill hearing, the Senate hearing, for CIA director nominee Mike Pompeo. The power went out, and the C-SPAN cameras went dark, just at a point where he was talking, I think, about the allegations of Russian interference in our election. And in a completely unrelated event, the only connection is that C-SPAN was affected. There was a speech being given by my old friend Maxine Waters, on the floor of the House, arguing about the importance of the Securities and Exchange Commission and deploring the nomination of a Wall Street lawyer who has represented uh, Goldman Sachs and other entities as the new head of the SEC. And at one point, she broke off and started talking about broader issues of Russian hacking. And there was, according to people who were watching, not on the cable channel, but on the online feed of C-SPAN, just at the point where she started to talk about Russia, she was cut off. And the feed from RT, the Russian-backed American cable news channel, suddenly replaced or displaced the feed from Maxine Waters on the House floor, on the C-SPAN Internet feed. It didn't affect the cable channel, just the Internet feed. So this is easily explained. C-SPAN, in a statement, says it was probably a technical error because their television broadcast continued uh, uninterrupted. As RT is one of the networks we regularly monitor, we are operating under the assumption that it was an internal routing issue. Now, that's what they believe, and I believe that. And it's possible that this could have occurred in a very isolated way. It might not have been a national phenomenon. It could have been a switching error that occurred regionally or locally. As it turns out, it appears that it did affect the entire national Internet feed of C-SPAN. Now, we don't have an explanation for the power outage in the Senate hearing room so far. But that didn't stop Rachel Maddow from spinning this up as, <gasps> better crouch under your chair, friends. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Well, there was a movie called The Russians Are Coming. It was a comedy with Alan Arkin and Carl Reiner back in mid-1960s during the Cold War. 
And I feel, if you have a chance to view that, and you never have, it's a hoot. A uh, Russian submarine comes up on the East Coast, and they send a landing party. They're out of gas. I don't remember the uh, particulars of it. But it is very funny. And I feel like this is a replay of the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, without a laugh track. And to give you an idea of how this is perceived, I want to use my friend Gary Chu, the guy from Sacramento who gives us film reviews here on the Peter B. Collins podcast. He's a good guy. But from his Facebook posts and his recent email traffic, I think Gary has been pretty taken by this whole wave of hysteria about Russia in interfering in the election, hacking the DNC, passing that information to WikiLeaks. And I know Gary will be listening to this podcast because I've tipped him off. I'm going to talk about this. But, Gary, uh, do a little homework, please, and go back to some of my recent podcasts. Let me recommend the interview with uh, young cybersecurity consultant Trent Lipinski, who doesn't believe the claims of Russia hacking. At any rate, Gary wrote to me last night, just before I flipped on my delayed uh, DVR uh, tape, uh, you know what I mean, the recording of the Rachel Maddow show. He says, if you watched Maddow this evening, you saw her piece on weird stuff happening during the CIA director nominee's hearing today. Then Rachel showed some video on what happened to uh, Maxine Waters speaking during some C-SPAN coverage. The first incidents being the power going off without any reason in Pompeo's hearing and during the uh, spiel by Maxine Waters when another video audio about Poland or something interrupting the C-SPAN feed. Now, that's the RT feed. And so this certainly aroused Gary's uh, curiosity and attention. And then he said, here's the kicker from old Gary in Sacramento. I was watching earlier the first role of the Chris Matthews Hardball Show. About a quarter hour into his show, he was interviewing David Ignatius of the Washington Post about all the Trump-Putin shit, <laughs> that's what he wrote, and Russia's likely hacking of important things here in the U.S. During a stretch of Ignatius talking about all of that in response to Matthews' queries, when Ignatius said the word Russia in one of his sentences, the video froze with his image, and the word Russia repeated over and over for several seconds like a stuck vinyl record would and way longer than one might expect. Then the screen went to black. Then Hardball seemed to start again from the top briefly, then quickly broke for a commercial. He said, I've never seen my Comcast cable feed fuck up quite like that before. <laughs> now, Gary acknowledges, it may have just been a coincidence what happened to my eyes and ears in my own living room this afternoon, but it did happen. And he offered a little caveat at the end of his piece here. He said... Uh, uh, he signed it, Jichu along the American River. Oh, yes, I haven't been drinking today. No weed, no LSD, no nothing but coffee. But, Gary, I believe that uh, even if you were abstemious yesterday, that you've been dipping into the vodka-flavored Kool-Aid served up by Democrats and the intelligence community out of Washington, D.C., so I'll continue to pay attention and see if there are other explanations for these anomalies. The David Ignatius tape is not featured on the Hardball website. It could have been just a technical problem and they decided to scrap the whole interview. Or it could have been an editor or a boss at MSNBC who said, oh, I don't want that broadcast. But the implication that was clearly left by Rachel Maddow is that this could be Russian hacking. And while I acknowledge that it could be that, it could be almost anything, including simple technical failures. And to feed into the hysteria that's already been generated about these matters, I think is highly irresponsible. And it is the kind of fake news that MSNBC and all of its... Uh, you know, esteemed people have been slamming BuzzFeed for. Oh, how could you put out an unverified report about Trump and golden showers and being compromised by the Russians? Well, <laughs> this was domestically driven. And I think it was really shameful that Rachel Maddow has reached this point. Another element of fake news exposed Trevor Noah on The Daily Show last night 
talked about the news conference that Trump held on Wednesday. And I referenced it that he used a trick that uh, Tricky Dick Nixon had used uh, to put out, you know, just piles and piles of paper as a photo op and say, look, you know, Trump said, these are all the forms that I've signed to uh, resign from corporate boards and to separate myself from my businesses. Well, Trevor Noah discovered that the content of the folders appears to be empty pages of paper. These papers are just some of the many documents that I've signed, turning over complete and total control to my sons. Good Lord. <laughs> That's a lot of Rebe, paper. The multimedia so piece. much paper. What is he doing there? It looks like a police chief showing off a homework drug bust. <laughs> like, as you can see, we found a lot of math. Uh, we found a lot of accounting. Uh, but yeah, but, but jokes aside, you have to be impressed. Look how much work he's been for America. But don't look too close. Because if you do, you might start to notice things. For instance, the paper inside the folders Grabian. doesn't look Multimedia like weeks of contracts. It looks brand new. <laughs> yeah, and I know some of you might be hating. You might be like, you might be like oh, Trevor, no, you're just hating, you know. Uh, but, but, but you tell me, if you had real folders, wouldn't you at least have labels on them? <laughs> so what he discovers is that the folders aren't even labeled, and the paper looks like it's just stacked up as if it was simply pulled out of a ream picked up at Office Depot. So uh, <laughs> we are living in a strange time, friends. It is truly bizarre. And to cut through the crap, the fake news, the spin, the propaganda, the disinformation, let's just look at actions. The Obama administration has ordered thousands of American troops to be transferred from Germany into Poland as part of a uh, reconfiguration of NATO to send a message to the Putin government in Moscow. This has been in the works for months now. And I look at this as the real evidence of the Obama administration's endgame toward Russia. This is part of the long-running effort to isolate Moscow by trying to uh, seduce the border nations that were part of the Soviet Union into joining NATO or at least the European Union orbit. And so today, the first convoy of American troops and others from the NATO partnership moved into the town of Olzina in Poland, which is on the, uh, <laughs> the eastern border of Poland. It's the western border that uh, shares Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. So they got a long way to go to really get to the Russian border. But this is all being staged for the TV cameras and to send this kind of a message to Putin. And this is a, probably going to be reversed in two weeks when the Trump team, the wrecking crew, takes over in Washington. A second American contingent is supposed to be dispatched in April. But we'll see if the Donald and his team will uh, follow through with that or make changes to these uh, deployments. In Washington, the House joined the Senate today in laying the groundwork for quick action to repeal the Affordable Care Act, approving the budget blueprint that was passed by the Senate early on Thursday morning. Still, there is no even description or outline or even a few talking points about what will replace Obamacare, and that's making a, a lot of people nervous, including people who are covered presently by Obamacare. And in a great op-ed published in my San Francisco Chronicle today, Roseanne DeMauro, who's the executive director of National Nurses United and a brilliant uh, political strategist, in full disclosure, I've done some work for her union and I know Roseanne a bit, and she has taken comments from Obama and from Trump about the Affordable Care Act. Obama said, if you can put a plan together that's demonstrably better, I will publicly support repealing Obamacare and replacing it with your plan. And then she quotes Trump. We're going to have a health care that is far less expensive and far better. And Kellyanne Conway saying, we don't want anyone who currently has insurance to not have insurance. So Roseanne says, well, let's take them up on this, both Obama and Trump. And the solution is single-payer health care, Medicare for all.
And she ticks off the reasons why the Republican uh, proposals that are likely to surface, like health savings accounts, that's a boondoggle for Wall Street, only works for those with healthy bank accounts and healthy bodies. The idea of allowing insurance to be sold across state lines sounds good, but when you unpack it, she says, it allows states with minimal standards to sell policies in California, where we have much higher standards. And she makes some other arguments as well. I've linked to that op-ed so you can read it at your convenience. One way to drive down health care costs is to reduce the cost of prescription drugs, pharmaceuticals. Bernie Sanders made that a centerpiece of his campaign this year, and he offered a symbolic amendment on Wednesday night to allow Americans to purchase drugs from Canada where they're considerably cheaper. And this idea of re-importation is one that makes a whole lot of sense. Unless, of course, you're a supporter of Big Pharma. Thirteen Democrats in the Senate voted against the Sanders resolution. They said, well, it doesn't have enough safety standards to make sure that the drugs that were made in the United States and shipped to Canada are safe when they come back from Canada. You know, those Canadians, they love to tamper with pharmaceuticals. So then Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, uh, put up a uh, an amendment that would have allowed the importation pending safety cer- certification. And that was voted down as well by the same group of 13 Democrats. And notable among them is Cory Booker, who won bouquets earlier this week when he broke precedent And he testified against the confirmation of fellow club member Senator Jeff Sessions to be attorney general. Well, Cory Booker is one of the people who voted against the Sanders and Wyden resolutions. And it says a lot about his ties to Big Pharma and corporate America. President Obama, who earned, I guess, the uh, un- unpleasant title of deporter-in-chief. More than two and a half million non-Americans were deported during his eight years in office, has closed a loophole that was being exploited by Cubans. It was called the wet foot, dry foot policy. And that phrase comes from the idea that if a Cuban could get to Florida and set one foot on American soil, that they were entitled to preferential treatment and fast-track to U.S. residency and citizenship. This has been widely abused, and particularly since Obama reopened the door to Cuba, what we've seen is 65,000, I'm sorry, 55,000 Cubans arrived, many at our Mexican border, during the past year alone. And because they were able to get not just one dry foot, but two dry feet into the United States, they were put on a path to residency and citizenship. So uh, one critic of the policy, Peter Kornblue, the co-author of Back Channel to Cuba, says the exceptionalism of the wet foot, dry foot policy toward Cuba is a relic of the Cold War. And this decision by the administration is really its final effort to normalize an area of interaction between Cuba and the United States. I think that's pretty interesting. Meanwhile, protesters have taken to the streets of Gaza, and they are protesting both Hamas, which runs the Gaza Strip, and the Palestinian Authority, which is in charge of the West Bank. And a dispute between these two Palestinian uh, political groups has led to long power blackouts in the Gaza Strip as much as 21 hours a day during the coldest part of the year. And people are piping up. They took to the streets. And one guy who is a a comedian and a singer, his name is Adel Al-Mushuki, he posted a Facebook video of himself cursing the lack of electricity as well as no jobs, no border crossings, no food, no water. Enough Hamas, enough Hamas, he said. And uh, the video got about 300,000 views and got him a trip to jail. That's how... uh, The the, uh, strong men of Hamas operate in the Gaza Strip. There's also unrest in Haiti following the arrest and uh, extradition to the United States of a man who was recently elected to the Senate in the nation of Haiti and thought that was going to give him immunity from arrest. His name is Guy Philippe, and he's been on an American uh, drug enforcement uh, uh, agency 
uh, warrant for a long time. He's one of their most wanted Haitian suspects. But he's also very popular, and violence started in the southwestern city of Jeremia, and uh, mobs have been throwing rocks and breaking things. Now, Philippe is a former police and military official with a pure, poor human rights record. I don't know if he was part of the Tantan Makut or not. But in 2004, he staged the invasion of Haiti that ousted uh, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide. And uh, he was secretly indicted by a federal grand jury in the United States in 2005. And they've been trying to apprehend him ever since. Before he was arrested, he said, I'm not hiding. I just want my justice. The thing is, they have no evidence against me, and they know they don't. Uh, so we'll see how that sorts itself out. And finally, here in segment one, some good news for people like me here in California. The last week of deluge, and we got over a foot of rain at my house. The buckets are completely full. It means that the drought is officially over for some 42% of the Golden State. There is an area around Los Angeles that is still considered to be in a deep drought, but for the rest of us, things are improving, and I am very glad to report that. And every day I like to take a moment to thank the people who support my work with your subscriptions to the Peter B. Collins podcast. Jason Spitzer, who gave me the tip on the coverage we provided yesterday about the progressives winning election in the California Democratic Party. Joe Carson, the whistleblower from Tennessee, who's a longtime subscriber here. And my friend Jim Garrison just took out a huge monthly subscription to the Peter B. Collins podcast. I'm grateful to each and every one of you. You can become a subscriber, too. Just visit PeterBCollins.com on any device. Click the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page. And in minutes, you can decide how much you'd like to do to support the Peter B. Collins podcast. Loretta Lynch is in her final days as Attorney General under Barack Obama, and the Justice Department has been making some interesting moves. They announced yesterday that uh, they filed a motion to join a lawsuit against the New York City Board of Elections. And this comes out of the uh, real mess that happened there during the Democratic primary when it was discovered that more than 117,000 people from Brooklyn had been removed from the election rolls simply because they hadn't voted in previous elections. Some of them actually had. And this is part of the kind of purge mentality that we saw take place, particularly in Republican-controlled states and strongholds across the country. Now, I certainly support this investigation, but we need many more. We need an investigation of the interstate cross-check list that the intrepid journalist Greg Pallast exposed and still has not been taken seriously by the corporate media or by elected officials. And there were other purges that occurred, like in the state of Ohio, where Secretary of State John Husted got his wrists slapped uh, and was ordered to reinstate nearly 200,000 voters just before the election, voters who had been inappropriately purged. And so Brooklyn is an obvious example, but it's only the tip of the iceberg, and it's more evidence that the Democrat leadership, Democratic leadership, did rig the primary to prevent Bernie Sanders from defeating Hillary Clinton. The Justice Department has also issued findings from its investigation of the Chicago Police Department. And it's not surprising, but it is quite an indictment. The Chicago Police Department regularly uses force that is unjustified, disproportionate, and otherwise excessive. Investigators found that police violated both the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution and department policy in the use of deadly force. Now, I would argue that the Fourth Amendment is important and that there have been uh, un unreasonable searches and seizures in Chicago, and we'll get to their use of surveillance technology, which violates the Fourth Amendment in a moment. But I believe it's the Fifth Amendment that uh, has deprived people of life and liberty uh, without due process that uh, is what the report should be finding. I don't know if this is an error in the Guardian report that I'm uh, reading from here or uh, from the Justice Department report itself, or maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I do quibble with that. Investigators faulted poor training and accountability systems for contributing to the department's unconstitutional policing practices. Now, as you may know, 
I cut my teeth in Chicago. I was on the radio there in the 1970s. I witnessed a great deal of police brutality, cover-ups, and uh, other uh, rogue behavior by the Chicago Police Department. And it is not only intentional, it is encouraged and covered up by the brass. And until they really start to deal with the accountability issue, I don't think that much is going to change. So Chicago and the Department of Justice have entered into an agreement in principle committing both parties to negotiate a court-enforceable consent degree, uh, decree to implement reforms. A couple more details. The report excoriated the Chicago Police Department uh, and particularly faulted officer training and use of force and the way officers who use unreasonable force are held accountable. It also outlines systemic problems within the department regarding how officers are supervised and supported. That's just pretty legal you know, language to describe what I just said a minute ago. And so uh, we're going to see some possible changes there in Chicago. And the day before, on Wednesday, Loretta Lynch was in Baltimore where she announced a reform agreement and a, a plan for a consent decree to try to deal with that out-of-control police agency as well. Kevin Gostola, the great young reporter who publishes at Shadow Proof, tells us that a federal lawsuit has been, a filed, uh, been filed against Chicago police officers, alleging that they used the cell site simulator Stingray to spy on activists and uh, those who were protesting or marching on uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, in uh, January two years ago, in 2015. They came together for a protest in March on the west side, and Jerry Boyle, who is a National Lawyers Guild legal observer who frequently goes to those demonstrations, claims that police used a cell site simulator to search his private cell phone and the cell, fine, uh, cell phones of nearby protesters, bystanders, and Chicago residents. Now, this is the most specific, explicit claim that has been brought about the violation of one's Fourth Amendment rights using this uh, dragnet system called Stingray. The lawsuit says... The police deployed the cell site simulator in the immediate vicinity of private homes, private offices, juvenile courts, medical facilities, a church, and the protesters engaging in protected political speech. Police lacked a warrant or probable cause to search and seize the private cell phones of Boyle or any other person, and the surveillance was not by mistake, but the result of a clear policy. So the attorney representing uh, this gentleman, Jerry Boyle, the attorney's name is Matt Topic. He said, any surveillance of political groups is particularly troubling, but there is no dispute that even when the police have a valid basis to track a legitimate suspect, the technology results in a search of every other phone in the area to find the suspect. This is a violation of the Fourth Amendment rights of hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent bystanders every time it is used. And this may widen out to a class action suit. Bring it on, I say. Many people use the uh, application called WhatsApp. It's a smartphone app, and I've got it on my phone. It tells us that uh, it offers uh, some of the best encryption available, end-to-end -end encryption. And it is text and voice uh, communication. And it is extremely low cost. It's either free or a dollar a year. And WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. And Facebook has represented that no one can intercept WhatsApp messages, not even the company itself. But new research from the University of California, Berkeley, shows that the company could, in fact, read messages due to the way WhatsApp has implemented its end-to-end -end encryption protocol. And essentially, if I have sent you an encrypted message, but you have not yet opened it, well, it is possible for WhatsApp to force the generation of a new encryption key for that message before the recipient gets a hold of it. And that would allow them to intercept and read those messages. And if they've got a backdoor, well, the NSA probably can use the same backdoor, only they might be able to drive a truck through it. WhatsApp issued a statement. WhatsApp does not give governments a backdoor into its systems and would fight any government request to create a backdoor. Well, operate WhatsApp with this caution in mind. And a little clarification as our final item today. Yesterday I led with the news of the Inspector General's plan to investigate FBI Director James Comey's handling of the Clinton email uh, scandal. 
And I referenced the that this, sh- this should cover all of the episodes, not just the two letters that were issued by Comey to Congress in October. And the New York Times does clarify today that the news conference in July at which he announced that he wasn't indicting Hillary Clinton, but he described her behavior as extremely careless and enumerated a number of uh, violations of federal law and then said he wouldn't be indicting uh, you know, or pursuing an indictment. Well, the inspector general's office will be uh, including all of those issues and said that they initiated the investigation after complaints from members of Congress and the public. And so it'll be very interesting to see where this leads. Now, the inspector general's uh, attorney says that uh, there, there's no suggestion that Comey's actions were unlawful. The question is whether he acted inappropriately, showed bad judgment, or violated Justice Department guidelines. And it's not clear what consequences, if any, would uh, impact James Comey if the investigation leads to a finding that those events occurred. So just prepare for another whitewash. That's what we're expecting. Thanks for listening to my news and comment podcast all the way till Roy Rogers sings at the end here. You can find my daily podcast on YouTube. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.